So welcome to video number three about World War II. Now we're going to kind of take a step back and look at what was going on with the United States. Um, we had to find a response to Hitler's rise to power and Mussolini's rise to power. Um, FDR is, of course, president. Um, he has um, he is going to have a third and fourth term. Well, start a fourth term. Uh, what are we doing in this country to counteract the rise of Hitler and, and uh, Mussolini? Well, Congress passes a series of neutrality acts from 1935 to 39. It restricted arms sales, loans, and transports of goods to nations at war. The 1937 act did allow belligerent nations to buy non-war-related goods. This was called the Cash and Carry Plan. FDR himself did not want isolation. Uh, what the cash carry plan is, they had to come and get it, pay us in cash and take it away. Uh, FDR knew that Hitler and Mussolini and others were a threat. And in 1937, FDR called for an isolation of aggressive nations. He was then accused of being the world's police officer and had to publicly affirm his support for isolation. This was something he was not happy about. He apparently grumbled, grumbled to an aide, it's hard to lead when no one will follow you. And so we continue to watch. We see the Munich Conference. We see Poland. We see the beginning of the war. And still, here we are. Opinion polls in this country show that a most opposed intervention in the war, but 84% supported Great Britain and her allies. It's kind of a weird poll. We said we don't want to fight, but if we did, we know whose side we'd be on. FDR wanted to help. He revised his cash and carry to include weapons to Britain. FDR then decides to run for a third term. He wanted to become the, quote, arsenal of democracy. We traded 50 destroyers to Great Britain for 99-year leases on some British naval air bases. Um, and in 1941, we'll actually uh, expand the Lend-Lease Act to, um, well, basically, what happens in 1941, we have to institute the Lend-Lease Act when Britain can no longer pay us. So what we said basically was we we're going to lend you this material and then you can pay it. You can lease it from us and pay us later. The rationale was, you know, if your neighbor's house is on fire and you have a hose, you don't haggle over the price of the hose. You put the fire out first and Europe was on fire. Uh, and so after the Hitler attacks the Soviet Union, we extend the lease lend program, the lend lease program to the Soviet Union. By 1945, we had provided $50 billion worth of supplies to our allies. Now, we began a debate in this country between interventionists and non interventionists those who want to go to war and those who do not. Now, one of the um, strongest voices for going to war is a guy you probably have actually heard of, a guy named Dr. Seuss. And I want to show you. Here's a couple of examples of his, uh, his work here. You'll notice uh, the man in the bathtub is wearing a hat that says America first. And what it says basically is isolationism doesn't work because the world is just too small. Obviously, the debate becomes moot once the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, after two decades of distrust. Now, as I mentioned, we got into the war with Japan. FDR realized that we needed to fight uh, Germany as well. Unfortunately, Hitler took that decision out of our hands. Uh, we also, you know, tried to buoy up our new allies, the Chinese. Uh, Life and Time magazine will actually do stories on how you could tell the difference between the god-awful evil Ch Japanese and our friends, the Chinese. Um, there's going to be more anger and racism toward the Japanese 
uh, after the, the Bataan Death March, which happens a little bit later on. Uh, even Dr. Seuss will do some horrendously racist cartoons. Uh, you can go online, you can find all kinds of them. In fact, one of the extra credit assignments you can do is to find three propaganda cartoons uh, and write about them, as long as it's not the one that I'm going to show you later. Um, so, you know, it's really a problem. Heck, there was even a Japanese, uh, there was even a Superman cartoon called Jap Killer. So eventually we will even round up Japanese citizens and place them in internment camps. Uh, George Takei was put in one as a child. Uh, they were basically told that um, to grab everything they own, they may or may not be coming back, and they were uh, put in trucks and sent to the internment camps, uh, some of which were in Arkansas. In January of 1943, uh, the Army will recruit young Japanese men and some of them will become the most distinguished fighters in Europe for the Americans. Uh, if you remember the Karate Kid, that was part of Mr. Miyagi's backstory. Uh, most people during the war will work, ended up with a lot of disposable income because there wasn't much you could spend on it. Women will take uh, essential jobs. Rosie the Riveter becomes very big during this time. Toward the end of the war, they were encouraged to go home. Um, though this time they're not, they don't go as willingly. Women even served in the military, in the army, you had the Women's Auxiliary Corps, the WAC, in the Air Force, it was the WAIF, the WAIF, actually knew a WAIF, she had been stationed in uh, Japan after the war. I don't know how old she was, but at the time, heck, her mother was even still alive, so good genes in that family. There were some disputes between industry and labor and some racial discord. Uh, African-American leader A. Philip Randolph wanted to march on D.C. for black equality. Um, FDR didn't want that to happen, so that led to a ban of discrimination in war contracts. Also led to the Fair Employment Practices Committee. Uh, the Army, however, will still be segregated. Usually African-Americans would serve in non-combat roles. Uh, finally, we will create the Tuskegee Airmen, probably some of the greatest fighter pilots we've ever seen. Um, the problem was white pilots, it was easy for the, the Germans to, uh, we had these convoys in the air, so you had the pilots supporting, protecting these cargo planes, and what the Germans found is you could like, attack the white pilots and they would veer off from the plane, the cargo plane, allowing a second wave to attack it. These African-American fighters uh, did a much better job of actually following orders and doing what they were supposed to. Uh, for a long time, we didn't know anything about them because like, they wouldn't take off with the, the cargo plane, nor would they land with it. They would be replaced by white pilots at the beginning and at the end. It was very kind of unfair. Uh, there's also racial violence against Mexicans who wore zoot suits in L.A., one group that did not receive such hostility were the Native Americans. 25,000 of them served during the war. Navajo code talkers is how we talk to each other. Each unit would have a Navajo Indian, and they would just speak in their own language, and the Germans were never able to decipher it. Uh, probably because, well, they're racist. Uh, they lived among the whites in their units. They were the most important. Um, you see it in some movies how you had to protect them. Uh, we will suffer defeats until May, mid-1942. Uh, we could not stop the Japanese from taking Pacific possessions. We lost the Philippines in early 1942. The Japanese will plan to take Australia, and then they wanted to take out the rest of the U.S. Navy in the Pacific. Now, what I want to do is shift back to kind of the overall war notes and um, we'll get back to some of the American stuff in a bit. So 1942 to 43, the U.S. entered the war on the side of the Grand Alliance of Britain and the Soviet Union. We had to overcome suspicion of each other. The U.S. agreed that defeating Germany would be the first priority and increase the number of trucks, trains, and planes and arms we sent to Britain and Russia. We focused on military tactics instead of political differences. We agreed that we would only accept the unconditional surrender of Germany. We believed it would encourage uprises in the Axis nations. 
1942, the Japanese advanced into Southeast Asia and the Pacific, while Hitler continued to fight in Europe. Germany will have a chance to win the war until the fall of 42. German forces were prevailing in North Africa under General Erwin Rommel and advanced toward Alexandria and Egypt. Germans also had success in the North Atlantic with submarines and led to a renewed offensive in the spring of 42. Uh, they will capture the entire Crimea. This was their last success in Russia. In North Africa, British forces stopped uh, Erwin Rommel at, Al at a place called El Alamein in the summer of 1942 and forced Rommel to um, retreat across the desert. In November of 1942, British and American troops invade French North Africa. German and Italian forces surrendered there in May of 43. We developed sonar to help us destroy the German submarines. On the Eastern Front, the turning point will be Stalingrad. Hitler decided to attack Stalingrad first. Fought from November of 43 to November of 42 to February of 43. German troops were stopped, encircled, and defeated, finally surrendering on February 2nd, 1943 in Stalingrad. The German Sixth, Ar Sixth Army, which started with 100,000, lost 300,000 total. So they were replenished and lost three times their company. Uh, the Germans were pushed back to the positions they held in June of 42. By the spring of 43, Hitler knew he could not attack the Soviets. In the Pacific, the Battle of Coral Sea will be fought on May 7th to the 8th, 1942, halting the Japanese advance, relieving Australia. On June 4th, the Battle of Midway Island, American planes destroyed four Japanese aircraft carriers. This established U.S. naval superiority in the Pacific and will begin our um, process of island hopping as we begin to push the Japanese back to their home islands. Now, it took us a while to kind of figure out how to fight the Japanese. The Japanese believe in the code of Bushido, that they will give their life for their country and their emperor. This led to kamikaze attacks. What would happen is you would have Japanese planes bombing American positions, and sometimes when they ran out of missiles, they would just plow their plane into it. This was something Americans were not used to. We're willing to die for our country, but we would much rather live to fight another day. So this was kind of terrifying. It was George Patton that kind of put it in perspective when he said, you don't, you know, what we got to realize is you don't win wars by dying for your country. You win wars by making the other son of a bitch die for his. And that kind of put things into perspective. So, by 1943, the war was going against the Axis, but it would still take a long time to force their unconditional surrender. We defeated the Axis forces in Tunisia on May 13, 1943. Allies crossed the Mediterranean and carried the war to Italy itself um, and began attacking mainland Italy in September of 43. Mussolini was deposed and arrested. The new Italian government surrendered. Mussolini was then uh, rescued by the Germans and set up as a pu puppet government in northern Italy. German troops then occupied most of Italy, setting up a defensive line in the hills south of Rome. It was a very effective line. It forced the Allies into heavy casualties. Rome will finally fall on June 4, 1944. And, uh, and normally, you know, you would think that would be a humongous deal. The fall of the first Axis capital. But we don't remember it. And the reason we don't remember it is because of what happened two days later on June 6th. And that is called Operation Overlord. We often call it D-Day. Now, one thing that Churchill, Stalin, and FDR would talk about, and they would meet periodically during the war, was the need to open a second front. Churchill wanted to go basically the way he was up to Italy through the Balkans, where he would meet the uh, Russian forces before they got to Germany. Well, Stalin wanted a cross-channel invasion from England and where basically American and British troops would meet up with the Soviets somewhere in Germany. Uh, 
Stalin didn't like, or Churchill didn't like that idea because he was the only one kind of looking out. But he's overruled. So what comes here is uh, D-Day. So one thing that we do is we're going to invade in Normandy. Uh, and the Germans knew that it was just a matter of time that it was coming anyway. Well, we do set up a deception with Patton. He sends some troops to the closest point between England and Europe. And, you know, because that would be a logical place, right? And so he's making a lot of noise to try to kind of fool them where the invasion would actually take place in Normandy. Now, this was not a foregone conclusion. Many things could have gone wrong. The weather could have tanked. Anything could have gone wrong. Um, Eisenhower, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander, wrote two letters, one taking responsibility for failure and one talking about the success. But Eisenhower was able to land five divisions at Normandy, eventually establishing a beachhead. Within three months, we landed 2 million men and 500,000 vehicles. We pushed inland, breaking the German lines, moving south and east. We liberated Paris by the end of August. Germany was now, and I should mention my grandfather actually came in to uh, D-Day plus seven, I think, uh, the day you wanted to go in. Those first days were terrible. Liberated Paris by the end of August. Germany was now desperate, trying one last desperate offensive, the Battle of the Bulge. It slowed the Allied advance, but by March of 45, the Allies crossed the Rhine River and advanced into Germany. At the end of April, moved into northern Germany, linking up with the Soviet army at the Elbe River. From the east. Germany tried to go on the offensive rather than create a defensive posture. From July 5th to the 12th, 1943, the Germans lost the Battle of Kursk, which was the greatest tank battle of the war, losing 18 panzer divisions. Remember, each panzer division had 300 tanks. The Soviets began advancing westward, reoccupying the Ukraine at the end of 43. Ended the siege of Leningrad, moved into the Baltic states in 44, advancing across a northern front. They occupied Warsaw in January of 45, entering Berlin in April of 1945. Hitler moved into his bunker, continued to arrange his armies. He blamed the Jews for the war and ordered his final solution. He had received word that uh, Roosevelt had died. Harry Truman would be the new president. He thought that was a sign. However, it was not to be. On April 28th, his buddy Mussolini was killed by a mob. And on April 30th, he and his wife or girlfriend, Ava Brown, committed suicide. Their bodies were supposed to be burned, but apparently the Soviets actually found him. And supposedly somewhere in the Kremlin, they have Hitler's brain. On May 7th, 1945, German commander surrendered. That is called VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, May 7th, 1945. However, the war against Japan continued, moving slowly. Um, until military commanders will convince President Truman that there would be heaven casualty of an invasion of Japan. So that leads us to... the atomic bomb. Now, this was called the Manhattan Project. Now, what had happened, this had started with an idea of um, Albert Einstein. He had written a letter to FDR saying that he thought we could harness the power of the bomb. This is one of his great regrets. And so we began the Manhattan Project under a scientist named J. Robert Oppenheimer in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Uh, we will build and test our first atomic bomb in the summer of 1945. Now, here's the thing about this. No one really knew how much destructive capability this would have. Some scientists even thought that it would be so bad that the heat from the bomb would uh, catch the oxygen in the air on fire, creating a chain reaction that would destroy the world. Well, it wasn't quite that bad, fortunately, but those were the scientists who were really gung-ho. So we knew that we built and tested our first A-bomb in the summer of 45. We knew that the Japanese were susceptible to bombing. 
Their air force had been devastated, and we began bombing Japan on November 24th, 1944. By the summer of 45, most of their factories had been destroyed. Truman believed that a direct attack could result in a million casualties. So I want you to put yourself in Truman's spot. What would you do in this situation? He had two A-bombs, just two, Fat Man and Little Boy. And he needs to decide what to do. Does he drop them on Japan? Does he drop one? Does he tell them they have this weapon and they should surrender? Does he try to do a demonstration? There's just so many things he can do. Well, the truth of the matter is, and a lot of people see racism here, but he decided to do what FDR was going to do. And that was FDR was going to drop the bomb on somebody as soon as they were ready. He didn't care if it was Berlin or Tokyo. And so Truman drops his first to the two bombs on Hiroshima on August 6th, and more of a military target, Nagasaki more of a civilian target on August 9th. We did ask them in between if they wanted to surrender. There were some problems with translation. They thought that unconditional surrender meant they could not keep their emperor. We didn't care about that. 70,000 buildings would be flattened in Hiroshima. 140,000 people died by the end of 1945. By the end of 1950, another 50 had died. Japan will surrender on August 14, 1945. This is VJ Day, Victory in Japan Day. 17 million soldiers will die. 18 million to 50 million civilians will die worldwide. Now, the last thing I want to talk about with the war. And then we're going to segue into our last week with the Cold War. I'm going to talk about some of the end of the war stuff there, too. I want to talk about the Holocaust. It's not exactly an American topic, but it's so very important that we talk about it. What was the Holocaust? It was the deliberate attempt to eliminate the Jewish people. In 1922, Hitler has said there could be no compromise. At first, he promoted immigration. In September of 39, that policy began to change with the Madagascar plan, where he planned to send the Jews to Madagascar, but that plan was just not feasible. A more drastic plan was developed by Heinrich Himmler, the leader of the SS, who shared Hitler's views. The SS will be given responsibility for the final solution. The administrator will be a horrible man named Reinward, Reinward, Reinhard Heinrich. After Poland was defeated, a new strike force called the Eidsensgruppen was created to round up Polish Jews and to put them into ghettos. In June of 1941, they will be told to act as mobile killing units. Now, what they would do is they would try to dehumanize the Jewish people as much as possible. First, they made them wear a Star of David, yellow Star of David on the outside of the clothes. If you've seen Schindler's List, you've seen this. Then they started referring to all men as Israel and all women as Sarah. Then they started to do the uh, identification tattoos. Polish Jews were the first to be put into ghettos. In June of 41, they were told to act as a mobile killing unit. SS death squads followed the regular army into the Soviet Union. Their job was to round up Jews in villages, execute them, and bury them in mass graves, often dug by the victims themselves. This led to low morale of the executioners. But they were told that they were not responsible, they were just good Germans following orders. This led to the creation of the death camps. Jews in occupied countries were rounded up, packed into freight cars, and shipped to Poland. There were six death camps in Poland. The largest was the Auschwitz Birkenau. They used experts from their T4 program that had killed 80,000 unfit Germans from 1938 to 41. What made you unfit? Disabilities or being gay. They used a gas called Zyklon B, which was hydrogen cyanide. It was most effective for killing people in large numbers. The gas chambers looked like showers, and the corpses were burned in crematoria. A conference was held at Wansi on January 20, 1942, to explain the final solution. Officials would cooperate fully. 
In the spring of 42, death camps were in use. By the summer of 42, Jews were shipped from France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. From 40 and 43, they came from Berlin, Vienna, Prague, Greece, southern France, Italy, and Denmark. And 44 from Greece and Hungary. This took away valuable train time from the military. Military officials wanted to use Jews for labor, but were overruled. 30% of arrivals at Auschwitz were sent to the labor camp, which meant 70% went to the gas chamber. So basically the way it happened, and if you ever get a chance, go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., is they the Jews would be out on the line. There would be doctors spot-checking them to see who was worthy of working and who wasn't. Children and old people got sent to the, uh, the gas chambers immediately. Um uh, Others went in. So basically, you go in, you go into this, what looks like a big shower. If you were going on into the um, labor camp, it would be a shower. If not, it would be the gas chamber. Um, they would cut the hair of female to sell for mattresses or clothes. They would perform horrible medical experience on some of the victims, catching them on fire, throwing them in ox, just seeing how they reacted to different things. Uh, Mendeloff was probably the worst. In fact, he was so bad that his those who worked with him actually burned his notes because they thought it was so terrible to use, try to use what he had learned in such a way. The Germans will kill five to six million Jews. Three million will die in the death camps. Let's put it another way. That is 90% of the Jewish population in Poland, the Baltic countries, and Germany. Two-thirds of the Jews in Europe were killed. Now, a lot of people like to argue that this didn't really happen. It wasn't this bad, but there are records. They were proud of what they did. And uh, extra credit opportunity, there's a Twilight Zone episode called Death's Head Revisited. You can watch it and write a half a page about what it means to you, uh, what you learn from it. Uh, and it really kind of captures that. I want to mention two Holocaust survivors with an American um, connection. The first is a man named Tom Lantos. He was the first and only Holocaust survivor to serve in the uh, House of Representatives. The other was a man named Lavieu Labrescu. You might remember hearing about the Virginia Tech massacre. He was a professor. Uh, he lost his life actually protecting his students. And he's worthy, I think, of praise because that's just amazing to me. Going through something that was so dehumanizing and still having your humanity intact to help other people at the end. Just absolutely amazing. Now, I should point out the Nazis were also responsible for the deliberate death by shooting, starvation of overwork of over 9 to 10 million others including 400,000 gypsies, the leaders of the Slavic people, clergy, intellectuals, civil leaders, judges, and lawyers, possibly 4 million Poles, Ukrainians, and Belarusians, 3 to 4 million Soviet prisoners, and thousands of homosexuals. So that basically finishes up what I want to say about World War II. Now, what you're going to see in another module is propaganda. What I want you to do is I want you to watch both videos. One is a doctrinization film for the Army, and the other is a cartoon. And then on the discussion board, there will be a special discussion board to discuss how why you think it was propaganda. Uh, also, the extra credit will be you can find three uh, propaganda cartoons and in half a page each explain why they are propaganda. Uh, if you have questions, please let me know. I look forward to our discussion about World War II. Obviously, there's a whole lot more that we could cover here, um, but I'll have some supplemental videos as well. So talk to you later.